In this video, I want to talk about method factors. In a way, this video is a follow up on a previous video that I made on model misfit explaining why sometimes models of confirmatory factor analysis or structural equation models show a bad model fit. And so you might want to take a look at that video also. However, you can also follow this presentation here without having watched the previous model, the previous video on model misfit. So here you can see we have a one factor model with four indicators. And for example, we might be measuring uh, affect uh, by self reports. And so we might have some items in our questionnaire for measuring affect or mood that refer to a positive affect and others that refer to a negative affect. And then what we often find is that a unidimensional model with a single factor does not fit. And when we look at model modification indices, for example, or at model residuals, as I explained in a previous video, then we might find that there's a large modification index for a residual correlation, for example, among the negative affect items or among the positive affect items, or we might find a large covariance residual for that association between the negative items or between the positive items in our residual output, for example, in the program M+. And so then one way to address this issue is to allow for a residual correlation um, as is shown here. So allow the error variables to be correlated. However, as I explain in this video here, this has certain disadvantages when you do that. And so I'm going to show you a way that I think is more appropriate for handling such effects. Another example would be if you were measuring affect with different rata. So let's say P1 and P2 are not positive affect items, but are items referring to self-reported effect and N1 and N2 and N2 might be indicators referring to a friend report of affect for that same person. So then you have a design with uh, two different rater types that report on the same construct. Sometimes we call this a multi-trait, multi-method design. If we have multiple raters and maybe also multiple traits, not just affect, but maybe also other constructs that are assessed and such multi-trait, multi-method designs can also be addressed with confirmatory factor analysis in different ways. And one way is to introduce method factors for reflecting rater effects or other kinds of method effects. So in that case, also when you have multiple raters, then you might find that you cannot fit a unidimensional model with uncorrelated errors, even though the raters are supposed to measure the same trait effect or the same construct, there will be rater specific effects that cause the self ratings to be more highly correlated with one another and those friend ratings to be more highly correlated with one another, causing an inhomogeneity in the covariance structure so that a single factor model will not show a decent fit. Now, what are other ways to address this issue? In my previous video on model fit, one solution that I presented was that you could have two factors. So you could have a factor for positive effect and a factor for negative effect. And that might be a perfectly fine solution. In that model, you address the lack of unidimensionality issue without having to add correlated errors. Instead, you're assuming that each set of indicators has its own factor. And then you can take a look at the correlation of these factors. And so then the size of that correlation that is estimated here in this model would show you the degree of specificity, so to say. So you could then see how highly positive effect is correlated with negative effect. And the closer this correlation to a negative one, the more those indicators measure the same construct, except that they're not um, coded in the same direction or not keyed in the same direction. And so that would then give you a sense for how much these measure the same attribute or not. And also you would address the issue of model misfit because this model is likely to fit a lot better than a single factor model without correlated errors. Now, why is this better than having correlated errors? The correlated errors don't explain anything. So then what happens is that a systematic source of variance, a method source of variance or method effect, 
gets shifted towards the error variables and that error correlation signifies that there is a systematic source of variance that is not accounted for in the model. And so from a psychometric perspective, from a measurement theoretical perspective, we don't like that so much because then the error variables do not just reflect error, but instead they also reflect a systematic variance component and then we are underestimating the reliabilities of the observed variables when we um, use R squared in the model to estimate reliability. Now, some people are perfectly fine with that and they say from a factor analysis perspective, the epsilon error variables contain both error and unique variance and I don't care if this is unique variance, then let it be confounded with error and that's fine. But from a more classical test theory perspective or a measurement oriented perspective, we would say we would, would like to address, we would like to see all systematic sources of variances of variance be addressed and be reflected by a latent factor rather than by error. And so this model here does that because we have now two factors. And so now the covariance structure is better represented by latent variables and the errors should be uncorrelated unless there are some other method effects such that maybe P2 and N2 are the same items just um, differently worded, then it could be that there's still some issue with unidimensionality. But other than that, we should be able now to take um, all the effects into account and estimate the reliabilities properly. Now, this video is not about a correlated two-factor model, but it's about method factors. And so I want to show you another solution or another way to address this issue of method effects or indicator heterogeneity. And so another way to address this is by introducing a so-called residual method factor. And so that approach was presented by Michael Eid in 2000. The idea here is that we would pick, for example, the positive affect indicators as reference and say positive affect is our reference method for assessing affect and the negative items are our non-reference method for assessing affect. Or if you have multiple raters, then it could be that the self-report is chosen as reference method because people might have the best access to their own affect and mood states compared to friend reports. Friends may not know as well how I feel. And so the self-report might be the more valid method in that case with regard to affects. We might pick um, the self-report as reference and we might use the friend report as non-reference method. And so then in this case, the factor that we use as reference is the same as the P factor, the positive affect factor on the previous slide in the correlated two factor model. So this factor here, P has the exact same meaning. It's defined by the P1 and P2 indicators. So the positive items in this case. And now um, rather than having a separate factor for N, that is correlated with P, we allow the N items to also load onto P. And then in addition to that, we introduce a method factor M that is uncorrelated with P. So it's a so-called residual method factor. It is formally defined as a latent regression residual in a linear regression of the non-reference items or the negative items on the positive factor. And so then this method factor represents residual variance in N1 and N2 that is not accounted for by the positive factor. M is uncorrelated with P, so it represents a unique source of variance. So in this model, the M factor accounts for that residual association between N1 and N2 after partialing out P. And so the advantage that that has over allowing for a correlation between epsilon 3 and epsilon 4 as on the first slide is that now the variance is explained or that residual covariance is explained by a latent variable M. And so then we can separate variance components and we can still estimate the reliabilities of the indicators appropriately. And we can also then assess convergent validity of the non-reference items or non-reference methods relative to the reference method versus method specificity in terms of proportions of explained variance. So one advantage of this approach is that it allows us to separate variance components and compute coefficients that 
um, refer to different portions of explained variance. Now, there are other ways, too, to introduce method factors. This is only one way, this residual method factor approach, but it has many advantages, particularly because it allows us to have an um, additive variance decomposition and a clear separation of effects. Other methods or other ways for introducing method factors are also um, available. Like, for example, you can have a method factor that is a latent difference score factor, and I will present that in um, a later video at some point, how you can also specify other um, types of method factors. Now let's take a look at how this model allows us to uh, define coefficients for separating different variance components. And so one coefficient here is the consistency coefficient. We sometimes also refer to this coefficient as a convergent validity coefficient because this coefficient expresses the proportion of variance in a non-reference indicator that is explained by the reference factor. So in this equation you have yim where i indicates the variable and m indicates the method. So in this case this would be method 2, the negative items, and we have two of them. So we would have y12 and y22, the two uh, indicators corresponding to negative effect. And so those have loadings, lambda, on the reference factor P. And so the lambda reference loading squared times the variance of the reference factor for the positive items divided by the total model implied variance gives us this consistency coefficient. Or more simply, you can also calculate it based on the standardized loadings in this model. So you look at the standardized reference factor loading, and then you square that, and then that gives you also consistency. Now, what does this mean? Consistency means the proportion of variance that the non-reference indicators share with the reference factor. So it would tell you, for example, if the negative items had a consistency value of 0.7, that 70% of the variance in these indicators is shared by or shared with the positive factor pointing to relatively high convergence between positive and negative items for assessing affect. So the higher the consistency coefficient, the closer to one, the more the positive and the negative items measure the same construct or the more self ratings and other ratings measure the same trait. So that's a measure of convergent validity or consistency relative to the reference method. The method specificity coefficient in this model does the exact opposite, so to say. It looks at the proportion of variance in a measure that is explained by the method factor. So for uh, the non-reference indicators for which we introduce the method factor, we have also loadings, delta, on the method factor. And so the loading delta squared times the variance of the method factor. Um, divided by the model implied variance of that indicator gives us the proportion of variance that this factor explains <clears throat> in a given non-reference measure. Or again, you could simply look at the standardized method factor loading, so delta in the completely standardized solution and square that and then you also get the variance accounted for by that method factor. So for example, if you find that the method factor or that the method specificity coefficient is 0.4, then it would mean that 40% of the variance in that measure are explained by this method factor. Notice that these are unstandardized loadings in this um, equation, in the first equation here, whereas these ones are standardized loadings. So that is important to take into account when you make those computations. And the easiest way really is to look at the standardized solution, take the standardized loadings and square them to calculate consistency and method specificity. Now in this model, those two coefficients for a given variable add up to reliability for a given variable. So that shows you that now we're not ignoring a reliable source of variance. So method specificity is now not confounded with error or epsilon, but it's a separate source of variance. So it becomes part of the reliability estimation. And so you can calculate reliability as the sum of consistency plus method specificity for the non-reference indicators. For the reference indicators, you only get consistency because those indicators don't have a method factor. And so that also then gives you reliability by simply looking at the consistency for the observed um, reference 
items. The reliability coefficient is the same as what programs for confirmatory factor analysis like M plus give as R squared for the observed variables. So that's the exact same thing here. So this shows you how a model with a method factor allows you to address different issues. You can avoid correlated errors, which can lead to models that are not parsimonious, that have many parameters, parameters that sometimes aren't, where some are significant, some are not significant, and then you don't know, should I drop the ones that are non-significant? What does it mean that some of these error correlations are non-significant? And also you underestimate the reliabilities of your variables when you have correlated errors, because then there's a systematic source of variance that is not taken into account. With this model here, we also can quantify convergent validity relative to a reference set of indicators versus method specificity in terms of variance components. And then we learn something about how much of the variance, what proportion of the variance in an indicator is specific versus is shared with a standard method or reference method. I hope you found this presentation useful. If you're more interested in statistics tutorials, I offer more detailed workshops on multi-trait, multi-method and multi-rater analysis where I discuss models like that in greater detail. You can find those in the description below um, this video. And um, also you can subscribe to this channel and leave a comment if you have other topics that you would like to see discussed. And I'll see you next time.